Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, for those sales reps who sold in the pandemic, it was very challenging, and it still remains challenging. But when you think about medical device reps, their target audience are people that work in hospitals. So whether it's clinicians, physicians, hospital executives, and their primary goal is to look after patients and keep them safe. But when you think about the level of acuity, the increased amount of patients, that becomes very difficult for med device reps. So I'm excited to have a conversation today to really break apart and look at insights and tactics where medical device reps can get in front of their audience. And to help me answer these questions, I'm delighted to have Ted Newell to the podcast. Ted is an expert in marketing and sales of medical devices. He's a consultant to small, medium-sized businesses, founder of MedTech Leaders Community, and the host of Medical Device Success Podcast. So pretty much Ted is everything medical devices. So Ted, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So Ted, why don't we just start a little bit, you know, obviously you're an expert now, but you didn't start an expert. So maybe just give us a little bit of a journey as to what got you to where you are today and a little bit just to frame the conversation of where most of your time is focused at today. Okay, so like most of your audience, I started out carrying a bag right out of graduate school. So I was I started right in the uh, med tech industry, selling to neurosurgeons and to urologists and the plastic surgeons. And back in those days, you didn't get much training. It, we called it "take the bag and go," and um, we had to, we sort of floundered out there. But that's that's what I did. That's how I started. I moved up through. Um, positions of greater and greater responsibility in marketing and in sales, and then into executive positions where I had worldwide responsibility for uh, marketing and sales for a couple companies and also ran the um, U.S. operation for an Israeli company as a president of, of a division here. And over most of that time, I worked with a lot of new concept products, new concept technologies, So we were always having to think outside the box in terms of how we uh, shared that information with practitioners and gain their trust and gain their business. Amazing. So thinking outside of the box and gaining their trust are obviously two things that haven't changed, even from when you started your career. And I think when you think about our discussion today, a lot of it is going to be think outside the box because, you know, we're kind of up against the wall right now. So how do you look at this problem that we're facing now, really, of gaining access for the medical device community? Well, it's a it's a difficult problem. And I think the first thing people have to do is they have to take this seriously. They have to get real. And I'm just going to throw out some statistics that I've come up with because I'm researching for a, a, a podcast here in the very near future. But first of all, 2021 isn't going to be a whole lot easier than 2020 for the field salespeople in the med tech business, the medical sales business. The recent CDC guideline in the United States has your ability to not be quarantined after your vaccine is effective. That timeline for not having to be quarantined if exposed is only three months. So three months after the effectiveness of your second shot. If you're in a two shot program, you have a three month window where you don't have to be you so-called quarantined. And then after that, if you're exposed to somebody, you'd have to be quarantined. So let's just extrapolate that a little bit to hospital personnel, doctors, in addition to medical sales and marketing staff. Those windows are so so short that you know that the the vigilance that hospitals are going to have over who has access to their healthcare professionals is still going to be quite strong. Uh, The COVID variants are creating a lot of uncertainty. We don't know where those are going. So 
access is going to be tightly monitored. And if you look at a recent Fletcher spot survey, the good news is that patient volumes are going to return in Q2 and Q3 Q3 because we've got this backlog. But hospitals have suffered financially, and half the half of them are going to spend less on capital expenditures in 2021 than they did in 20, uh, 2019 and 20, uh, 2020. So capital expenditures are going to go down. So you have to be very watchful of that and strategize around medical systems and doctor practices that you feel are financially secure. Then 52% of the respondents in this survey, the healthcare professional respondents, said that their usage of virtual communication with vendors is going to increase in 2021 and post-pandemic. It's going to increase as opposed to decrease. So just because we think this pandemic is going to be over, these people expect virtual interaction to increase. That's a key point in people's planning for sales processes in the future. And vendor access, 55% said yes, they will allow uh, vendor access when the pandemic is supposedly over, but it'll be limited limited like it is now or more. 29% no access to salespeople. So those are critical bullet points that sales executives and salespeople need to take into consideration when looking out in the future. It sounds sort of grim, but I think there's some opportunities and you're, you and I are going to discuss these here as we go forward. I'm sort of setting the stage, but there are opportunities. And when we go through these opportunities, Karen, some people are going to be thinking, and that's why I'm going to create this warning right now, the first thought is we can't afford that. And my response is, well, you're not going to a regular trade show anymore. You're not paying for a lot of typical travel expenses, travels, meals, hotels, and such. Take those resources and put them into some of the things that we may be talking about here. Yeah, so many great insights there. Thank you for sharing all those data points. So just a few that caught my attention is 29% 29 is no access, 55% limited vendor access, but there will be an increase in virtual communication and interaction. So for me, that's kind of the silver lining. And and I think this is going to be part of our conversation that if people haven't already started uh, developing the tools to engage in a virtual environment, the writings on the wall, they're saying even beyond the pandemic, like this is the way we're going to go. And think about a hospital setting. I mean, I did this myself for 20 years. I know that, you know, they're in between cases sometimes that you think about how easy it is and how much quicker and more efficient it is to meet virtually, you know, from the, the physician standpoint, that it's like you have to up your game. You know, you have to really up your game. If this is the way they're going, you have to kind of meet them where they're at. So um, th- great points again. So just to building on that and, and saying it does sound a little bit grim, but our, our job today is to say, well, we're going to show you ways that we can kind of reverse some of this or think out of the box. So if we think about, as you mentioned, you know, you're saving money on some of these big conferences you're not going to, even national sales meetings. Think about flying your whole team and think about bringing in speakers, all that stuff. No travel for your reps that you should have the budget. And, you know, you kind of don't have an option anymore if you want to stay in the game. So we think top of funnel and where we used to go to get lead generation, all the big conferences in you know Las Vegas and Chicago and even in Toronto, those aren't happening anymore. So what are your what are you seeing in terms of virtual conferences um, from both sides, the the supplier side and um, and the vendor side? Well, the virtual conferences have been a real disappointment so far, and even the associations that organize these conferences are not happy. There's been a number of different platforms. The the attendees, and when I say the attendees, I'm thinking of the doctors and, and or hospital professionals that attend the conferences. From one conference to the next, they go from one platform to another. They have to learn something new, and it creates barriers for those attendees to get to the virtual trade show exhibits. So there's several steps they have to take, and anybody that's good at marketing knows that the more steps you put in between somebody reaching 
from in between somebody getting from one place and then reaching their destination, the less likely they are to get there. So that's been a real problem, and exhibitors have been terribly disappointed with these conferences. Again, the different platforms, the limitations on what they can do, and the limitations on how they can interact with the attendees. So the the exhibitors have been very disappointed, and we just had a panel on my podcast, as you know, we just had a panel discussion with some uh, people that had attended a number of conferences. I have attended a virtual conference. And so the general uh, recommendations are, if you have to go to a large conference to show the flag, have a small booth, show the flag, but don't hope for very much. You'll get better results out of smaller targeted conferences where there's a limited number of vendors and where you as a company may have more clout. That's a good way to do it. But then the other thing is you need alternatives. You cannot rely on virtual trade show conferences to make up for what you lost in face-to-face conferences and trade shows. So you need, you need some alternatives and those alternatives can, can be numerous. I don't know if you want, do you want me to start talking about some of those now? Sure. Yeah. So there's, there's a number of different things you can do. One is you can spend a little bit more money on your website so that you capture people as they come through, identify them and move them on into the CRM. Studies have shown that modern customers are coming into the decision-making process with a lot more information than they used to. This includes doctors and hospital personnel. They've done a lot more research. So if your website is, is made up in a way, for example, if you have a couple educational webinars, if you don't, you need to put them on, or white papers, that the person has to identify themselves to source that white paper and or webinar. And now you have a data point showing what their interest is and their identification goes into your CRM. And then your marketing automation software starts to track if they come back and if they look at something else. So let's say over a period of two or three weeks, this individual has come back, they've downloaded two white papers and they've watched one entire webinar that shows a high level of interest. You give that level of interest a ranking, you turn it over to the sales rep. And now when we talk about the sales process, the sales rep now has information about a prospect that has demonstrated interest, and that is a key to the gatekeeper. And we're gonna talk about gatekeepers in a couple seconds, but as you can imagine, in a virtual world, where you don't have any face-to-face, you can't use your charm, or you can't use the excuse, well, I'm here, can't I please see the doctor? That doesn't work anymore. The gatekeepers have much more leverage over sales personnel. But if you call a gatekeeper up and you say, well, we noticed that Dr. So-and-so had downloaded two of our white papers, and he watched one of our videos completely, I thought I would just call to check up to see if he had any further questions. Now the gatekeeper is in a position of having to make a decision. Gee, my doctor showed interest in this. Am I going to inf- interfere with that interest? Not likely. If you if the sales rep handles this information well, they may have an open door to to the doctor through that gatekeeper. And this is where a well, you know, uh, I should say an enhanced website. Take what you have, enhance it is capturing customer information, moving it to the CRM and onto the sales rep, and you've given the sales rep some new and interesting tools that they can leverage in trying to reach a new prospect. Basically, the uh, the conferences weren't as, as shiny and nice as we once thought they would be. It sounds like the platforms, a lot of, as you said, it sounds like there's friction, and we don't like friction in the buyer's journey. And, and when there's virtual friction, it even frustrates us even more. So it sounds like there's a a bit of a work in progress there. There's room for improvement. Absolutely. And then what you just described to me is basically a virtual buyer's journey. So a lot of people now had a sales process or a buyer's journey, but a lot of people have not updated it to reflect a remote environment. And what you described there was more of like a, an MQL. So marketing qualified lead coming in, the doctor clicking on the white paper that shows intent. You then know where they're at in that buyer's journey. Are they in the awareness phase or in the consideration phase? So you can start tracking, as you mentioned, then, you know, when he comes back again, 
Then it's pushed to the SQL, so it's now sales qualified lead. But when you think about the gatekeeper, and I don't like that word gatekeeper because it makes them sound they're negative. I just think they're an influencer. There's another, they're another layer that we can we can learn from and they can help us. But I love what you just said about saying, well, you know, your doctor downloaded this. So it's almost making it hard for them to say no because it's like, I, I'm not making this up. He's in he or she is interested. I'm just here to help get more information and facilitate the buying decision. So I think that's it's even easier just the way you painted that than. The, the normal way of doing it. Exactly. And you want to make the influencer, I call him a gatekeeper. <laughs> you want to make that person feel like, like they have some obligation to, to pass your information on to the doctor or hospital personnel. Maybe it's the head of infectious control at the hospital, whoever it might be. You want that person to feel like they, they're doing this healthcare professional a favor by letting you through and helping you communicate. Absolutely. And when I was talking about the, the marketing automation aspect of it, Canadian Tire, for your Canadian listeners, they're doing that to you every time you log on. And, and they're tracking everything that you look at, and they're, they're creating an algorithm that you're most interested in winter coats and boots versus fishing rods and uh, canoes. You know, they're tracking that and they're suggesting things to you. You know, these big commercial companies are so good at this that you almost don't even think about it when you go on their website or when you see the advertisements on online. Med tech companies are traditionally very poor at this, but, you know, we can we can do it and it doesn't take a lot. It's not a huge investment to put some of these things. And the other thing I was going to add is you can actually score the person's interest. You can you can program your CRM so that it d doesn't turn a lead over to a sales rep until um, a prospect's interest is at a like level three or level four out of, out of five, for example. And that's because they've touched enough points in your website to show that that level of interest, they get scored. I think that's a great point. And I would agree with you. I don't know how many med device or med tech companies are doing that, that uh, automated marketing and even lead scoring just to say, yeah, it makes sense now where we're kind of in that sweet spot where there, we got some traction, but now it makes sense to add more and, and kind of get that. Yes. So if we, if we've totally redesigned the sales process and we should have, and we, we should have redesigned this uh, all the way from, prospecting through to the close. And of course, part of prospecting is the trade shows, which is what we were just talking about and alternatives. And <clears throat> one thing I can can say, which I, I didn't mention before, but it's, it's, it's somewhat humorous, is this whole thing about box trucks and the shortage of box trucks. And when you have practitioners and other healthcare personnel that cannot ask you to come in and visit. You cannot go into their practice. You cannot go into their office to visit, to have a, a, a typical introductory type of sales call. And so this problem is a, has occurred across all industries during the period of COVID. So it's not just the med tech industry. And what resulted is a, short of a shortage of box trucks. And the reason that happened is because companies of all industries have been buying or renting or leasing box trucks for long periods of time, and they're customizing them so they're actually a demonstration office. And so can you imagine driving up to, like in Toronto, to your hospital sector, or Cincinnati, they call it Pill Hill, which they call it in a lot of, a lot of cities, but in Cincinnati, it'd be uh, Pill Hill, the, the big medical area, four or five hospitals all within a block of each other. And you pull up in a place and then you have invitations go out and it's easy for the healthcare professionals, whether they're nursing per, uh, personnel, purchasing personnel or doctors, they can easily come to the box truck, wipe their hands with some sanitizer, keep their mask on, come in, have a product demonstration and leave. And so that is another alternative. You have to think outside the booth, as people say, and come up with some other things like box trucks or having your own virtual booth online, or investing more in very targeted webinars, uh, very targeted, not necessarily trying to get a webinar of 100 people, try to get a really good webinar with 
5, 10, 20 people that really matter and interest them, get a higher participation in the webinar by using some unique tools. And one of these tools is called Eat Engage. So E-A-T, capital N, G-A-G-E. And it is a platform that makes it super easy for a company and the attendee, the webinar attendee, the company to schedule a function. And it makes it very easy for the attendee to go online, pick out their food, and it will be delivered at the beginning of the webinar. So you could do a lunch and learn, for example. And they take all the logistics out of it, makes it really simple. It's great, especially for evening programs when a company doesn't have staff sitting around to solve problems. So there's there's things to do to think outside the booth and to create opportunities to educate, inform, and gain the interest of prospects. Well, I just want to pause there for a moment. First of all, I can't even get over the box truck. <laughs> I actually went to rent one and I couldn't get one. So now I know why. <laughs> but think of, think outside the box, literally. But I mean, you are replicating the face-to-face experience there. I mean, because again, everyone's online, but some people are struggling in the, in the virtual environment that if you can create um, a real life environment, even obviously you have to have maintain, you know, social distancing, but you can, they can see your product. They can see you. I just think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone's doing it here. Um, if they are, are they, how do they slot in? Do they get, you know, is there permits required or what, what would be required? I'm not sure how much information you have on that. If somebody was interested in doing that. Yeah, I would have to research that a little bit more. And also, um, I work with, a, another firm that has helped companies with this. I think you, depending on where you're going to park the truck, you might need to have permission from, the purchasing organization at a particular hospital, but it, or you might not if you park someplace else that's a, an open public parking or a place that they have no authority, and then they really don't they don't have any influence over it. They can't be angry because it's not on their property. On the other hand, they might encourage it. They might like the fact that somebody's brought a box mm-hmm. truck in, and their staff can go in and out of that truck, maintain their sterile protocols and and sanitation protocols. And they don't have a sales rep wandering around the halls. Um, so it could be if you explored it with, uh, you know, people in a hospital administration, they they might be very friendly to it. I think even getting someone off site, you know, once they're out of their environment, they can actually let loose a little bit and focus on. I, I just found, you know, when they're, they're not focused because they can hear bells going off, they can hear things going on in the unit. And I think when you can get them off site, you just have a different type of relationship. And I think that's a game changer because to be honest, it's a differentiator. How many people, how many companies are doing that? Right. So right. I would but, say any company out there that isn't and want to get a leg up on the competition and kind of keep top of mind with your clients, get discount, 1-800 discount and get a box truck. <laughs> now, one one alternative to that, if, if you can't find a box truck, is that some of these medical centers have a hot, have a hotel right in the middle of them. You know, they have one or two hotels that are right in the vicinity within walking distance. And so it would not be difficult for a company to rent a small boardroom or a small meeting room, set up a product display, and then entertain visitors to come in. And, you know, they can have, they can have uh, refreshments and so on there. That's another alternative that they can use in an environment. You want to make it easy. It's great if it's walking distance because then a practitioner walk out of their medical building, half block into the hotel, and they get a demonstration, maybe a snack, and they can go back to work. Um, same th- and same thing for hospital personnel. So that's another alternative. I think I think those are great, Ted. And if you think about those who maybe this, this isn't an option for them and they have to resort, re- resort to virtual, you know, um, videos or things along those lines, what, what tips do you have for Two front, two twofold. One for virtual. Is there anything that they can be doing or sharing that's going to, you know, allow them to differentiate differentiate themselves from their competitors? And also, when it comes to that next step of trials, like how do they operate a trial in a remote environment? So maybe you could um, share a little bit about that for us. Having to go virtual, as we all know, is something of an impediment to traditional sales practices. 
but it's also an opportunity. It can actually broaden how you prospect and how you start to interact initially with prospective clients and current clients. So let's look at it a couple way, a couple different ways virtually using virtual tools. One is that if you have a large geography, there's probably areas of your territory that you did not get to very frequently in the past, or if you did, you're only there for part of a day, knocking on a few doors, then you leave. Virtually, you can pop in and out of there anytime. So why not use the virtual appeal to some of the f- farther off areas of your territory that might not be getting hit so often by your competitive sales reps or sales reps in general, they may be more open to a visit. And you can bring more to the table virtually because if the company can redirect some of its resources and have perhaps it's a medical liaison um, available that can be used in these calls or it could be a key opinion leader, you can now bring somebody into that call. And so you can call somebody and you can just say, well, I thought Dr. Jones, um, I might be interested in hearing from Dr. Smith about some of the techniques he's used in this particular procedure or with this particular device or product. And I'd like to set that up and we can do that virtually because now this is an opportunity. It's so easy to bring a second or third person into the virtual environment to share information with your prospect. So I think the virtual tool gives you greater reach and greater flexibility. Um, you can, and then do a virtual lunch and learn, you know, you don't have to drive 200 miles to do a lunch and learn. You can do it virtually and you can offer that to the customer. Again, you can use a company like Eat Engage or simply ask the practice what their favorite places for food delivery. They'll organize it and you call, you call the restaurant up and pay the credit card bill, um, that's going to deliver it. So I think it gives you, um, you know, greater reach. That's that's one thing. That'd be one particular area. Uh, do you have any questions on that? Because I I did have another uh, another thought. I do. Before you go on, I love the idea of the key opinion later bringing them in virtually because you think about access, you think about cost, and you think about where that sweet spot is to bring them in at the right phase of the buyer's journey. Which is, you know, if you can position that and get all those things right, it's going to better position you to to be successful. But in the, in the virtual environment, you have access to probably some of the executive committee that wouldn't be in attendance to your face-to-face meetings. So you might get these executives that are actually going to attend because of their scheduling. It's easy for them, but the KOL also might be enticing for them. So I, I know you mentioned reach, which is great, and I think you're going to get wider and higher with your audience because of virtual. So where some people think it's a hindrance, I I see it as an opportunity. You know, you're getting access to people you probably wouldn't have otherwise met. And they're seeing a different side. They're seeing a a KOL talk about something related to your product or a technique that is aligned with your product that better positions you. So I think that's a fabulous idea. Uh, Again, if anyone's listening to that and has never thought about that. Yeah. So a little further outside the box, I interviewed a CEO yesterday and he talked about virtuous circles, virtuous circles within the organization. And by that, he meant one function working with another function and support. And the example that he used, he was a COO of a, of a high tech med tech company. And what he was talking about is bring the customer or the prospects into the company for a tour. So now let's go back to those. Uh, it doesn't even have to be the prospects in the further reaches of your territory it can be anybody, but you could invite them to a tour. You're, You're not inviting them to a sales call. You're inviting them to learn something more about your company and you'll provide lunch. So again, you, you engage the company, the services of one of these luncheon companies like Eat and Gage, and then you have 10 doctors show up and they get a virtual tour of your company, how it works, get to meet some of the employees. And then maybe one of the doctors you ask one of the doctors that happens to be a customer. So you sort of have customers mixed in with prospects and you have a customer give a short presentation to the employees about how important their product is to that doctor and to his patients or her patients. And now you've created a really great relationship building experience that you can go back and build on. And that door now might be more open to you. I'm just thinking when it comes to, you know, you've shown them, if you think about the flow here, we've shown them on a box truck, we've maybe 
supported that with a KOL. And then, you know, they want to get their hands on it. But again, you know, we can't go in the OR. So what options are available that they can really get that tactical feel and, and maybe look at best practices? Maybe this is a new technique that they're going to be trying. Maybe it's a new product. So how can they familiarize themselves with a new product um, to trial prior to purchasing? I guess it depends on the nature of the product. If it if the product required something of a wet lab for initial product demonstration and training, you might try to create a kit, a wet lab kit that could be sent to the doctor, and then you would walk him through that wet lab virtually. That might be one way of doing it. If it's a product that where the hospital requires something of a trial, an evaluation trial, or if it's uh, a product that will be used in the doctor's practices that would require trial, then you need to find a way to help that doctor understand how to use the product properly. So there has to be a training component. And I think the training component can frequently be done by via Zoom to some extent. But if you're getting to the point where you're going to use the product on a patient in the hospital or in the doctor's practice, then you're going to want perhaps a platform that's a little bit more sophisticated and really helps you and especially the doctor and his staff use the product correctly. And let me give you an example, one of those platforms. It's called Explorer Surgical. So like, uh, like somebody that's exploring the wilderness, Explorer with a capital O-R in the middle, uh, Surgical. And what they've done is they've created a virtual type of uh, platform where that has different levels for different kinds of products, but you can actually put the steps of product usage into the platform and the nursing staff or the support techs and or the doctor, they can actually be going through those steps as they use it and it, it assures best practices. And along with those steps are references. If they need to reference something like a little animated video that shows how that step is done, they just push on a button. And this animated video comes up and shows them exactly how that stitch was made or that cut was made or the angle of the instrument. And, and then, or they can actually see a live video. And at the highest level for perhaps a surgical product, Maybe it's a bit of a new concept and it's got some additional steps the doctor isn't used to. You can actually have a key opinion leader proctor that could be a thousand miles away. He is now attending that procedure with the doctor that's doing it. And that virtual proctor can actually reach into that virtual environment, into that video, because it's all hooked up to like the surgical microscope, for example. They can actually reach in with like a little animating pen and point things out, draw circles around things and say, well, you need to cut this. And I think you're going to find what you're looking for behind this piece of tissue. They can actually give that kind of advice right while the surgery is taking place. Or let's say it's a um, a patient care procedure that's bedside, they can do the same thing. So there's uh, these kinds of platforms. Explorer Surgical is one of them. I talked to their CEO the other day, and um, it is really impressive what they can do. And it helps your company make sure that best practices are followed, which is really good for your company and the results that you want to get. Because if best practices are followed bedside or in the operating theater, you're going to get good results. The, the floor personnel or the surgical personnel are going to be happy. The patient's going to be happy. And that's why this platform was invented to begin with. But now that COVID hit, it's become quite popular. And so there's platforms like that if you need to get into that detail. I, I've actually never heard of that, Ted. I think that's a fantastic platform. I think when you think about sales, regardless of the industry, the goal is to create an experience for your buyer, right? And creating a real, real-time learning experience where you have um, a key opinion leader that's able to troubleshoot on the spot or, and just correct and, and add advice and, and best practices. I mean, those companies that are in line with best practice, that's gold standard, right? So that's where there's an immediate alignment with the buyer if that's what they're into as well. So I just think 
that across the board, if you're not, if you haven't looked at Explore Surgical, I, I would highly suggest it just based on this learning of what I found out about it right now. I just think it ticks so many boxes that people now are potentially leaving this step out. And I know back in the day, people always wanted a non-patient trial. And it's just so risky to do that. I don't know if that would go on in the U.S. or not, but it did in Canada. And I think if that even did, this is a way out of it. And it's it's the second best thing to on-patient because it's real life. You have a, a, an expert that can guide you. You have animation that can give you pop-ups that will really you know allow you to navigate real time. So I think that is a fantastic um, opportunity for those who are in that trial phase or approaching it. Right, exactly. In fact, one of the genesis of the of the idea for Explorer Surgical were abs- were clinical trials of products that were being studied clinically for regulatory approval, and they wanted to make sure clinical investigators were using the product correctly according to the protocol that was set out. And this this platform, you know, helps assure that. Um, so yeah, I think those that that's another example of something that can be done, and it makes you look professional. It makes your company look so good. I would agree. I think a lot of what you've mentioned, really, if you think about you know your image, your reputation, your brand identity, the box truck, the Explore, uh, the Explore uh, Surgical, the virtual key opinion leader, like all these things are just top notch. You know, they allow you to stand out. And in times like this, when budgets are down and people aren't seeing you, but then they see this from you, it's a, a big awakening. So I think these are really great points that um, people should should take advantage of. One, a well, couple things, uh, uh, notes I would give to your listeners is that if you, you're increasing your use as a video, uh, one thing we haven't talked about, I think you may have talked about it before, is the use of embedded video to get people's attention. Um, You know, there's a statistic that 59% of executives say that they'd rather watch a video than they would read something. So um, embedded videos are a great way to, if you have the email of a prospect, to try to get their attention. But just be sure that when you're using videos, whether it's embedded and it's part of the prospecting phase, maybe it's part of a three or four video cadence in your CRM, or if you're using videos as part of a virtual presentation when you actually have uh, you know, the presentation time scheduled with a doctor or a lunch and learn. Of course, these videos have to be cleared with the marketing department or created by the marketing department, cleared and recorded for the quality assurance system. So, you know, they part, they are part of the QA system. It's part of the way you communicate with a customer. And that's not difficult. You do it for brochures and everything else anyway, but you just want to make sure you do that. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I would imagine the process, if they're going to do it, you know, for real time marketing or back in the day when it was handheld marketing stuff, it would be a similar process for this uh, virtual. Exactly. Exactly. A- any other thoughts, Ted, as it relates to video in various stages that you're seeing um, of the buyer's journey that are advancing, advancing sales reps or that are separating them from others. Um, a lot of people just think videos in the prospecting phase. Are you seeing it in any other phases that it's kind of producing game-changing results? Well, you, of course, it's in the prospecting phase. So when you get somebody's attention, create awareness, get their attention, and gain their interest. Those are three things that you want to get to so that you can then have a sales presentation stage where you present more information and you're going to need the video, the virtual presence to be able to do that is to actually have a, a presentation virtually to take them to the next step where they would actually show interest in trialing the product or buying the product, using it in some fashion. So there are a couple different stages where um, a virtual presence is required. And you, this requires training for the sales reps to make sure they understand how to use it properly, how the, how they, so they know how to set it up for the customer properly. You know, the customer might be getting hit with a Google meet one day, a zoom call the next, uh, go to meeting the day after that. So you, you have to be sensitive to that, not just assume that they know how to use your, um, 
you know, the tool that you're using for virtual interaction. So it come, but still it comes down through the sales process until you get to where you close the sale and, or need to do a, um, the, the product demonstration, which we talked about and, or a trial. And when you do get that far, like I talked to, um, uh, some of my friends recently and the hospitals, when you're at that stage, that's part of the limited access. You may get your access at that time to the hospital to help do perhaps some final training leading to a trial or, um, you know, that's part of a sale. Uh, if you don't, you can still do it virtually as we discussed, but if you might get access at that point. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like the, the technical skills are still required, obviously in a virtual selling environment for when it comes to presentation. And what I see is most people, as you said, there's so many changing platforms and these physicians don't have time to be learning the, the nuances between each platform, but also just managing the expectation, letting them know when, when we're going to, you know, have this 30 minutes, like this is the goal of it. And this is what I'm going to talk about and I invite them to what they want to see. I just find it's sometimes it's just a, a a feature benefit dump. And when you've asked for 30 minutes of somebody who's very busy and access is a challenge, but you were granted it, you know, if, if you're not delivering value and value that you've uncovered from previous engagements, you know, you've kind of lost that, you've wasted that 30 minutes that you probably won't get back. And a good example of, of making that mistake is having a PowerPoint presentation. Let's say it has 15 slides that covers, um, uh, three major benefits and you begin the conversation with the prospect a, as you're making this presentation, they're a qualified prospect now. Um, and so you're making this presentation and immediately they voice to you that they're only interested in this one particular benefit. They want to know more about it. Are you going to go through the whole slide presentation and waste all that time to get to that third benefit? Or are you organized? Do you know how to use PowerPoint um, effectively enough that you know how to move immediately to that third benefit that this particular person's interested in? You that you know you can't just flip through all the sides. That looks unprofessional. There are ways to use PowerPoint and to use use other presentation tools to be much more effective and much more professional, and it only makes you look good. So. I think that's one point. And then another point on presentations is, you know, I'm interviewing, um, I think it's Thursday this week, I'm interviewing a lady that used to be an actress, but she went into sales. And now she consults and she helps teach people um, to use acting skills on TV acting skills. And a point she made to me was that stage actors, before they get on TV, they take a TV acting course. You don't just go from stage acting to TV acting without any education. It's the same thing here. You don't go from face-to-face -face selling to virtual selling. And just because you can turn, turn Zoom on and off um, and you know share a document, that doesn't mean you're talented at interacting via video, via so-called TV. And so she teaches sales organizations how to interact properly uh, in a virtual environment. So just make sure that you've thought about some of these nuances as you go forward, um, you know, into this virtual world and try to improve it. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions, Ted, is that, you know, as soon as you turn on the video, it's the same as face to face. And then you're just, you know, you're not, people are frustrated because it's not the same, but it's like, well, it's never going to be the same. So kind of forget your expectations and create new expectations as to the experience you're going to create in a virtual environment. Because the tools, the techniques, the way we engage, the body language, the there's nothing the same, right? So I think, I think you're right, is that we have to start em embracing what tools we have, uh, where you look in the camera, how to engage, even turning your camera on, you know, and I think people that just flick their camera on and haven't even gone to the right mindset of how do I need to show up for this call? You know, what is the other person? Like what are the top three to five questions my audience is thinking right now? So I can be very others focused. People, people aren't doing that. They're just flicking it on and they're making it about them and they're sharing their slides. And, and just like you said, like if you're not able to navigate to where they want to go, you're going to lose them. But also when people are kind of holding the best to last, that was kind of two years ago approach, lead with it they want. 
right? What if your physician has to go and he's missed that third point and it's like, give them what they want up front. Cause you know, they're, they're, you know, chomping at the bit for that. Give it to them and just hang on to that one. If that's what they want. Normally people don't buy hundred percent of your product anyway. So if they want to focus on the 20%, stay there. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of great points. A lot of, for, for those in the med tech and med device environment, you know, there's a lot of things that we can be doing. So if you kind of are thinking, oh, you know, we're, we're up against a brick wall, you know, Ted shared a lot of insights from box trucks to key opinion leaders, just to engaging, you know, with the right techniques in a virtual environment um, that, you know, trials, the, the virtual trials, there's a lot of things that can differentiate you and also just create a real professionalism from um, from the standpoint of your of your customers. So I want to just finish when when you think about some of these large GPOs or buying uh, buying committees and those whose maybe contracts are coming up mid COVID now or you know in a pandemic and we know there's no access. What are they doing? Are they extending? Or so is it kind of like those are winning big and those left out on the outside are still on the outside trying to get in? Do you have anything you can share there as to what's happening with the GPOs? Well, some of them are exp- are extending contracts instead of going into n- new negotiations that might entail some product trials or uh, demonstrations. You know, in orthopedics, sometimes a product demonstration takes three months, and then the, then they bring in your competitor, and you have to wait for three months for the competitor's program to be finished. So it can be, you know, a lot of these things are getting postponed. I think what you have to do is, first of all, protect the business that you have. And if you're trying to get in on another uh, contract, maybe where you'd lost it before, you're trying to get parity, for example, trying to get equal access to a particular system, perhaps go in and argue that they shouldn't have an exclusive or they should be sure to have a secondary supplier for the purpose of inventory. And let me give you an example. The COO I talked to the other day I referenced before, um, they had a a reasonably successful 2020 because they knew that if they had one COVID case come up in one of their facilities, the entire facility would be locked down for a day or two. So that means they wouldn't be able to ship. And this is uh, life-saving atrial grafts that they are providing to um, surgeons to stop uh, people from, you know, dying in the middle of the day with absolutely no symptoms. So what they did was they actually offered some of their best customers consignments. And of course, yeah, that sure. It costs you money to offer consignment. There's that's capital. They put more inventory out with the field reps in the, in the field reps closet at home or whatever. And so they did these things to get inventory closer to the customer. So if the company, and they did have a couple shutdowns, if they did have a shutdown at one of their facilities and couldn't ship, the sales rep could come through or the hospital consignment could come through. So what you could do when you're looking at these new contracts is perhaps talk to that. You know, you want to be sure that you have uninterrupted supply, especially of some critical uh, critical supplies in this COVID environment, whether it's a, a life-saving product or it could even be a commodity product that just gets used up very quickly, you know, why don't you let us in on the contracting system and we'll do a couple interesting things to make sure that when a critical situation comes up, you're going to have what you need. There might be some things you can do like that. Get it, get it outside the old traditional contract thinking and start thinking a little bit more about what emergencies will face your customer over the next year or two because of COVID and how can you help that customer avoid those emergencies through extended product consignment, um, whatever it might be, uh, availability of experts. There's a lot of different things. I think that's a great proactive approach. And as you said, it's basically allowing them to do their, you know, you're doing due diligence for them that in times of crises, you have the response and, and when, when the time is right for buying again, you, they're going to be remember you for that, right? That's going to stand out for sure. I was going to say another strategy is that many times these people belong to like a hospital or a hospital system will belong to two or three different uh, purchasing organizations. 
and is to make sure that you have all of them covered because your secondary approach might be through another organization. And sometimes a, a really good um, a contract consultant can help make sure that happens. If you're a, a small or medium-sized company and you don't necessarily have the clout the big companies have, you might want to engage uh, a contract consultant that has all these connections and can make help guide you through this this maze of issues to make sure that you're covered. I think that's great. And that's what it is. It's a maze, but just navigating the complexity, but you're strengthening those relationships. And as you said, some of the smaller companies don't have the clout or the budget to, you know, to influence the way that the bigger ones does. So I think if you can get um, support that way and navigating in some contact names, I think that's, that's another great alternative. Um, I also like what you were saying about, you know, those who are sole sourcing now, I think when you, what we've learned from the pandemic is we need, we need alternates, you know, like we can't just have one vaccine provider now because we're looking to vaccine the entire world. Right. So it's the same in here. It's like, even though people are extending their contracts, maybe they're now open to, well, why don't we um, multi-award this so that we're, you know, there's less risk involved. So where maybe they would just give it to one vendor. Now they might be, you know, evaluating two or three. So even though you're out now, you're not necessarily out, or that could be a case to reopen the contract up and say, look, why don't you, you know, build in some mitigation plans here where there's two or three alternatives should the event arise that there's a supply chain issue. Another thing, you know, early on in this conversation, I referenced that one study about healthcare systems. Um, and one of the things that was in that study is what healthcare systems were asking for, what they were looking for out of vendors. And one of the th- one of the things they were looking for were in some cases, extended terms. Now, you don't necessarily want to get into a pricing battle all the time because that just costs you in the long run. But to extend terms for a short period of time or for a certain amount of product might be something that also helps open the door during this period of time when a lot of hospitals have been financially damaged. And they may remember that. Some people do remember these things when you help them out you know, in years to come, it could come back to benefit you. Yeah. They say leaders are born in times of crises and exactly that. I think you're going to be remembered now how you handle yourself. And if you don't have the flexibility to support people when they're in, in tough situations, as you said, they're, they're going to remember that and in, in not in a good way. Um, so Ted, we've covered so many different aspects about, um, really gaining access out of the box thinking and, and being creative at various stages for the sales cycle. Could you, you know, if there's someone thinking like, I really want to get started, I want to kind of hit the ground running, like where would you say the top three almost easiest way to, you know, low barrier to entry would be for them to start? Could you, could you give them three? Well, one thing I would say is make sure that you have redefined the sales process and make sure that the sales team understands that process clearly. And if you've redefined it, Build the tools in, like we were talking a lot about virtual tools, video, and so on and so forth. Build the tools into that process so it's easy for the sales team to gain access to them. And so this is a marketing and sales effort. It, you know, it's the kind of effort like you, Karen, you you would assist with redefining the sales process. Sometimes somebody that's outside the company looking in is a better way of doing this. So I, I would say number one, that is a key thing right there is to redefine the the sales process. Um, The second is just do it. You know, don't be scared of playing around with embedded videos and practicing on your own computer. It's actually a little bit of fun. You can get goofy and make some really stupid videos as you're getting used to working with the camera you know, making certain points, make sure you're following the points according to the guidance from your marketing department, you know, the quality system. Um, But have some fun. It's And be authentic. That's another thing. You don't have to have a video studio to make embedded videos that can be done right at your desk at home. People expect authenticity. And even the ones you do at your company, they can be very authentic. You know, go to the... um, Duluth Trading Company website and look at some of their product videos. They're a lot of fun. A guy shows up in a flannel shirt and a jacket at a work table 
plops the product down and starts explaining it. You know, you, it doesn't have to be a very expensive project and your customers actually will look at that and, and realize that it's authentic. It's company personnel that are making the video, not some actors, you know, make it, make it real. And I think people will appreciate that. Absolutely. So redefining the sales process, uh, updating your playbook to reflect all the virtual activities that we discussed and just get out of your head and execute. I, I think you're right there. A lot of people are leading with fear and the longer that they're holding back, you know, that's the more um, runway you're giving your competitors. So I would say absolutely get started as well. So thank you so much, Ted, for sharing all these insights. If people want to follow you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can go to medicaldevicesuccess.com and at medicaldevicesuccess.com, they will find a way to connect with me. There's the contact page. They'll find my podcasts, which um, aren't as sales focused as yours, but you know they might be interesting. And they will also find a place where they can investigate the MedTech Leaders community. So that's probably the, probably the easiest way to reach me is at the medicaldevicesuccess.com um, website. Great. Thank you. And those will be included in the show notes for the, for the listeners. Well, thank you again, Ted. I appreciate your time. It's great, Karen. I really enjoyed this today. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure.